Glad to see y'all out tonight. Brother Mike may be sorry after this is over that <laughs> let me have it by myself. We'll try and see. I'm going to take it. <laughs> Tonight's lessons on worship. And I'm going to read a lot out of the book. We're going to start on page 178. It says, for many years, the president of Wheaton College was Ray Edmond, a godly man and a great leader. In 1967, Dr. Edmond was preaching a sermon to the students in the chapel at Wheaton on the subject of worship. He told the students about having met the king of Ethiopia once and how he had to conform to strict protocols when going into the presence of the earthly king. He told the students that when they came into the presence of the Lord, they needed to come in a manner worthy of the King of Kings to worship. Suddenly in the middle of his sermon on worship, Dr. Edmund collapsed and entered into the presence of the Lord whom he loved to worship. Wouldn't that be a good way to meet God? Doing something he told us to do? I just wonder how many of us will be doing stuff we're not supposed to do when God calls us home. We really need to think about that. Today in worship, we experience it in three parts. Praise of God, prayer to God, and preaching about God. But in heaven, only one of these will remain. Praise of God. <clears throat> there will be no need to pray since we'll be in God's presence with all our needs met. And there won't be preaching in heaven because we'll have a complete grasp of the truth about God. Therefore, praise is all that will remain. And the Bible says we'll spend eternity in that activity. So we need to start here learning how to worship. Just continuing to worship. Praying to him. Singing his praises. The context of worship. John, along with Peter and James, was part of Jesus' inner circle of disciples. He was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's where he saw Jesus, his, his face shining as the sun, and his raiment, his clothes, turned just as white. He, he saw Jesus more for what he was. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was with him there when Judas betrayed him. He was at the crucifixion when they killed Christ on the cross. And he was, he was there for the resurrection when Christ came back from the dead. So he was pretty tight with Jesus. Amen. And he got exiled to the Isle of, Isle of Patmos because he wouldn't stop preaching the word. It was a difficult time in his life and as a disciple of Christ. But in the midst of that difficult time, he experienced something no one else ever had. He found himself peering through a portal into heaven itself. Well, let's stop right there and think about this. You ever find yourself in just a terrible time, just, just at the bottom of the pit, just don't know which way to turn? Who's always there for us? Jesus. And John was experiencing this with his vision to heaven. Let's read Revelations 4, 1. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, and I will show these things which must be hereafter. So he got called up to heaven. And this was about 60 years after they crucified Jesus and after Jesus went to heaven. John's vision describes events during the tribulation time. So he got to go to Patmos in the vision about the time
He got to go to heaven in a vision, and it speaks. I'm going to leave that out. I didn't get lost. <laughs> Let's go on to uh, the, center, the center of worship in heaven. The key word in these two verses, Revelation 4, 2, and 3, is the word throne. Throne in Revelation speaks of sovereignty, authority, rule, and control. There is one in heaven who is controlling all things for his purposes. The Bible says, no man shall see God and live in Exodus 33, 20. Therefore, when John looked into heaven, he only saw the appearance of God and tried to put it into words as best he could, like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. A jasper stone is what we know as a diamond, and a sardis is our ruby. So John saw a brilliant, multifaceted stone that sparkled in the light. Somehow what John saw was best described in terms of brilliance, worth, beauty, and light. I like this part. Describing God is like describing the wind. The best we can do is describe the presence or impact or appearance of the wind and not the wind itself. Let's go ahead and read Revelations 4, 2, and 3 now. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat it on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon him like a jasper and a sardine, sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. We see rainbows here, and we see an ark. I believe what we see what, what John saw in heaven was a circle. Because in heaven all things are complete. We only see half of it here on earth. <laughs> Let's go on to the chorus of worship. By looking into heaven and seeing the throne of God, John became an unwitting observer of, wor observer of worship in heaven. It becomes apparent from his description that where the throne of God is, there is worship. John sees 24 additional thrones around the central throne of God on which were seated 24 elders representatives of the church of the living God. There were also four living creatures around the throne who continually praised God. And when the creatures praised God, the 24 elders fell from their thrones and cast their crowns before the throne of God and worshipped Him. We've done studied about crowns, so we know that when we get there, hopefully we'll have crowns. Now he referenced Revelation, Revelation 4, 4 and 9 and 11, 9 through 11. So let's read that. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crown of gold. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Yeah. But I've got a question. David Jeremiah didn't include this part in here, but I, I really got to question in this. We go from verse 4 when he's talking about the elders sitting on their throne. Then we go to verse 9. And the first thing we read is, when those beasts. What beast? I don't remember reading about any beasts. So let's go back to Revelation 4 and we'll read 5 through 8. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, 
And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. I don't know why he skipped the beast. But let's go back and look at who were the 24 elders. I have to read a lot of commentaries uh, to get some of my information. One of them is Warren Wearsby. He believes if you take the 12 tribes of Israel which are the 12 sons of Jacob, who God changed his name to Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And you take the 12 apostles, and you consider all those people, the Jewish people from the 12 tribes of Israel, Israel and all the people that the apostles witnessed to and accepted Christ, and that comes all the way down to our age now. That's God's people. Is he telling us the 24 elders represents all of God's people at his throne casting their crowns? Very interesting. Yeah. Now let's get back to the beast. And again, these commentaries are people's opinions. I can't find it in the Bible. I can't find where it's written in the Bible. So I'm going by their opinions. And uh, on the base, I've got two different sets of opinions. So you'll just have to figure out which one you like the best and, and roll with it. <clears throat> Wearsby said the beasts symbolize God's creation and are related to God's covenant with Noah. So let's read Genesis chapter 9. Verses 9 and 10. And this is after the flood. After he destroyed the world with a flood. And remember, Noah took all animals, two of every kind, into the ark with him. And this is God speaking. He says, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, talking to Noah, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast on the earth. And verse 13 tells us what the covenant is. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. That's what the rainbow stands for, no matter what some groups try to make it out to be. Amen. Now, if we go by that, and we're already told what the faces of the, these beasts were, if we go with Wearsby, his covenant is with Noah, the face of the man. The beast had the face of a man. The fowl, a face of an eagle. The fowl that he's talking about got off the ark. The cattle, the face of the calf. And beast of the earth, the face of the lion. There's your four beasts. Now if we think that, which I like this idea, because 24 elders, you've got all of God's people. The four beasts relating to Noah's covenant includes the rest of his creation. So if we think about it, in heaven, all, the circle, all of his creation are worshiping him. I like that idea. Yeah. Now Tony Evans describing the beast and others, there's, there's a lot of people who believe this part, 
says it relates to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, which the book of Matthew, in whole, is the royal gospel of the king, Christ. That's the line. In Mark, it's the servant aspect of Christ, how he serves. That's the calf. In Luke, it's Christ as the compassionate son of man. There's your face of man. And in John, it magnifies the deity of Christ, the eagle. But I like Wiersbe's definition of it. Now we can go on to the crescendo of worship in heaven on page 180. Crescendo basically means to start small and end big, usually applied to a piece of music. In the worship songs in Revelation, there is an obvious crescendo that grows throughout the book. In Revelation 1.6, there is a twofold do doxology. Doxology is just a fancy word for a way to worship God. So if we look back in Revelation 1.6, says, And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. That's your do doxology. That's what he's talking about. The praise, the doxology, a way to worship Christ. And he goes on to tell us in chapter 4, verse 11, there's a threefold. So it'd be three different words to praise Christ. And he goes on uh, it gets to chapter 7, verse 12. There's a sevenfold. And he gives them here. <laughs> Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might. So that's the seven words he uses, his doxology that, that Jeremiah is talking about. On down in the verse here. It says, there has never been in the history of Christianity an emphasis on praise and worship like there is today. Christian radio stations can't play enough praise and worship music. Churches are incorporating more of it in their services. And CDs and DVDs of praise and worship are filling the store shelves. If what I'm suggesting is accurate, this crescendo of praise and worship we are experiencing is in accord with his timeline because we are getting ever closer to the grand finale of his purpose on earth and ultimately culminating with the praise of God in heaven. In other words, I know my wife likes that station K-Love, the newer Christian radio. I like the old Christian music, especially by country music. But they're coming out with new songs each and every day. What Jeremiah is telling us here is you see it more often today than you did in the past. That's one of the signs of the end times. And we'll go on. The contrast of worship in heaven. And I'm going to skip ahead to page 181. Seeing heaven was for John, like us walking up to the edge of the Grand Canyon for the first time, speechless and wondering. I guess it would be if we ever got to see heaven. John experienced smallness and largeness at the same time on Patmos. He was probably discouraged and despairing in the light of his personal circumstances. Haven't we all, all been there? Just get us down all the time, but Jesus is there just like he was on the Isle of Patmos. But then he is given a view of the grandeur of heaven and the majesty of heavenly worship, and he was changed. When he saw that all of heaven and earth were under the authority of God in heaven, he was able to look on his exile in Patmos in a new light. Seeing our lives against the backdrop of heaven is the best way to keep things in perspective. 
In other words, no matter what we're going through here, heaven's waiting for us. We've got to remember that. By necessity, our lives are focused continually on the present, the things of this world. We face demands in life that require us to focus on the here and now. Yet heaven is no less real, real than the present world. So we can't forget that. Heaven is there, no matter what we're facing here. When John's temporal word and circumstances were ushered into the presence of God, he was reminded there's something bigger and more important than today, than day to day. He remembered that God is able to do above and beyond what we can ask and think or expect. He remembered that nothing is impossible for God. We can be reminded of those same truths through worship. We may not see into heaven with our eyes, but we see the character of God through his word and our songs of praise that proclaim his worthiness. Things are not out of control. Satan has not won. So we just got to keep our mind focused on heaven, not, not so much the here and now. We, we do have to worry about here and now, our daily lives, but it's going to get better. And we got to always remember that. Worship's not about us, it's about Him. This is easy to forget. God is the center of our worship. It's amazing how many people in churches never get their attention centered on God because they don't like the hymns, the music, the style of worship, the personality of the worship leader, the color of the choir robes, or the hymn books, and a hundred other things. As a result, they make worship all about them instead of about God. We should come in here focused on worshiping God. Amen. When you go into worship service with a conscious intent to praise and worship God for who He is and what He has done for you, you'll have blinders on to keep you from seeing all the stuff you don't like. Worship isn't about those things, it's about God. So we need to keep focused on God. Worship's not about here, it's about there. Worship gets our mind off the things of this earth and onto the realities in heaven. The only way we live our life on earth with the values and priorities of heaven is to continually focus on heaven. If all we ever see with our spiritual eyes are the carnal and worldly affairs of this life, we'll struggle. I mean, if you just... If, if you focus on what's going on here, we're going to get down. We're going to get down all the time. To, and the world's not getting any better. Yeah. We need to keep our eyes on heaven. But if we are continually reminded of God's character, his purpose and his plan, and his love for us, then we walk through the world with a different gait. It's all about your attitude. If you wake up Thinking it's going to be a bad day, guess what? It's going to be a bad day. Colossians 3, 1, 1 through 3 reminds us to seek and set our mind on things above. We're set up citizens of heaven, and that is to be the focus of our eyes, our ears, and our desires of our hearts. So let's look at Colossians 3. One through three. <clears throat> if ye then be risen with Christ, and we are if we're saved, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So we belong to Christ. We belong to heaven. We're just passing through this old world here. 
We need to keep our eyes focused. Worship's not about now. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, that we're to look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The contrast he draws in these verses are powerful. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed. The affliction of today is light, but the weight of future glory is heavy. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18. For which cause we faint not. He's talking to the to the Corinthians here, they were going through a lot of persecution and trials of their own. Same as we are. We have trials every day in our life. So Paul can very well be talking to us. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, our bodies here on earth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Verse 16, I think, tells us because of our faith in God, He renews our inward man, our spirit. He, he renews us. Day by day. Remember when he led the Israels, Israel, the Hebrews out of Egypt and he fed them? He, he gave them manna from heaven every day. You couldn't store it up. We can't store our renewal up. We have to get it every day. We have to be renewed by God every day. Verse 17, he tells us, our trials in this life will build glory in our afterlife in heaven. The test we face each and every day will build glory in heaven. We just have to get through it. Sometimes we go through a bad time and we turn to God and, and pray to God but we don't hear nothing from Him. Sometimes a teacher's quiet during a test. I believe that's what God is doing is testing us. We need to stay strong in our faith. Verse 18. Only the eternal things of the spiritual life will last. Everything we work for all our lives, we can't take with us. Everything we work for, we can't take with us. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, Faith is the evidence of things not seen. We can't see God, just like we talked about earlier, trying, trying to explain the wind. We can't explain God. We haven't seen him. But we know his character, and we have to have faith in his character. Worship's not about one. It's about many. We live in a day when people don't believe they need to worship in church with the body of Christ. People claim they can worship in nature or on the golf course on Sunday morning. In the book of Revelation, what we see in heaven is corporate worship. Remember I talked about the people of God, the creation of God, all worshiping God? It's corporate. It's not just, just me or just Thomas or anybody else. It, it's all of us together. Yeah. Christianity is not an individual experience. And he tells us, yes, we're saved individually, but immediately we are baptized into the body of Christ. We become the church. The, ter the church is not just one person. It's the body of Christ, all believers. Verse 
Make sure that you learn to do on earth what you'll be doing for eternity in heaven. Worship with the many that God has redeemed for himself. I think we can learn a lot out of this lesson. We need to come to church. We need to be with like-minded people, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. We need to praise God for what he does. Right. Without God, we're nothing. Yeah. And I believe this lesson brings it out. And it's going to get interesting next week. It's going to be about the four riders. I haven't studied on it much, but I think that's what we're all really waiting to hear is the good, good parts of Revelation. The stuff we can't figure out on our own. So maybe between me and Brother Mike, maybe we shine a little bit of light on it. I've never done this before, so I don't know how to end it. Brother John, I yes, sir. Right here. You know, when you when you the introductory, you know, the gentleman that died and come out come to worship. The big thing I always heard amongst people was a lot of people say you have to worship for all rivers. I believe that. But then other people get excited about the spirit. There's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, you know, uh, I think we should, you know, get excited. I'm talking in an orderly manner about uh, for what God's done and what he's doing. I, I think but we all be excited, yes. I mean, I, I've seen great multitudes and I never hear a <coughs> man or a guy God preach. I thought, well, if they've been trained to not do that. Or, I mean, I think in mean, a lot of things I agree with because, you know, in this day and time, I mean, you know, that's, uh, I think it's not wrong either way. I think it's right. Some people get excited. I remember the shouting the old people years ago. Grandma and some of them, and someone got saved. And, and it, it was a lot, lot more the people before them than it was. I mean, you know, it's really common. And I know uh, Miss Alice being the Church of God is a little more exciting there, wasn't it? Yeah. But there's nothing wrong. I mean, I think as long as it's truly. That's it, not a show. Right. It's not a show. Right. Because he tells us in the Bible when we go to pray, go in your closet and pray. Yeah. Don't don't do it as a, as a show off, you know, showing praying for men and not God. Yeah. I remember a story one time. It was a preacher told about he was at the White House under President Johnson, I believe so it was, and he was given a prayer. And about halfway through the prayer, Johnson spoke up and he says, he said, uh, speak up, preacher, I can't hear you. He says, I'm praying to God, not to you, Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, that's what, we, what you're talking about in the services. You know, yeah, if, if we feel the Spirit, yes, amen, and wave your hands. And, and well, I just, you know, I, I think one of my favorite places in the Bible is we brought the ark in, and David did dancing in the street, brought out the symbols, and I was raised back to church, and no, Cotton Union, we'd raised the church, they didn't allow nothing in it. That, that ain't no word they can show me that was right because in the Old Testament all the way through, they brought everything out and celebrated the ark coming in uh, to the Lord. But, you know, we was right, that was wrong. I mean, wrong, or not even a strange instrument. I don't know where they cut. They weren't too learned. I never read the Bible. I've read it through several times. I mean, well, David is close to the to God's heart. Then most people say, well, you're living in New Testament days. We are in the days of grace. But, you know, I like it heavy. There's going to be a lot of music myself. Yeah, I believe so too. And I believe we got to be careful. Uh, just like we've talked about before about, uh, you know, people doing things their way. We need to do it God's way. And just like you said in here, it, it talks about that. It talks about symbols and, and trumpets and, and making a, a joyous noise. Unto the Lord. Well, let's just celebrate the separate returning and being gone. I mean, yeah. people are judgmental about it. Uh, Anybody else got any questions? I've got something I think you'll find interesting. Judy and I and Robbie and his wife up, up in Lizard County and got these huge rocks for him to go to the yard. And there's fossils that we smell. I mean, that proves water was over that. Mm -hmm. I thought that was yeah. Now I saw a show on TV, and and I don't know who it was, I don't know where it was, but different archaeologists at different places in the world was showing in this show they were showing uh, 
And I don't understand all of it, but a certain, uh, certain uh, rock or a, 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 I don't know how to explain it, uh, a layer, a layer of rock that could only come from flooding. Mm -hmm. And, and that, they were showing different places in the world. That's why these fossils that just start popping up on, you know, seven. Yeah. And that's how it come there in there with rock, you know. Yeah. The whole cold flu proves that because you can see animals and vegetation there in the most desert, arid places. So <coughs> one time it worked, it could. But you know, talking about time, what Trout was talking about, you know, you get into some conversations with people and you don't know very much, but if you start recording time, we know it as mankind, it ain't that many thousand years, but we really don't know how long the garden went on for what it really starts when the genealogy started out and then Barry came and Abel. You know, and that's where it picks up, you go back. How many years do you think it might have been in the garden before the sea? Yeah. It might have gone on for years and years and years. I mean, I mean, nobody knows. I mean, I can say this, I can say that, but nobody's just concrete on that. Well, like, like I said, the fossils proved it, it says it takes thousands and thousands of years pressure and all that. There was something here way before, I think reported time, what, 6,000 years? <coughs> Mankind? It's not much at all. Well, according to all the scientists, this earth has been here for billions of years. Now somebody had to start that. Somebody had to have that idea. I don't know if science is that good yet. I think I believe the Bible, what the Bible says. <coughs> Yeah. And there ain't nobody knows when the beginning was. No. God was the word, the word was God. <coughs> John just starts out, you know, that's how it starts out. Anybody else got a question about this lesson that I might can stumble through? I think it's a great mentioned, job. It's interesting. Uh, you mentioned my worship on a golf course or a lake or wherever. And, and uh, saying was uh, I don't know what lesson it was but when you hear people talking about well I've got a good relationship with God me and the man upstairs me, me, and, me and this you know whatever you gotta, you gotta watch uh, sure I can be out deer hunting worshiping God in a way but I also need the body of Christ, the church, y'all to lift me up <clears throat> y'all need the rest of us to lift you up. There's power in prayer. We've seen it. Well, when you go there, you don't know, need to leave God behind either. That's right. That's right. You don't need to forsake God for, for something like that. Yeah. Any more questions? Good job. Amen. Yeah. Well, since this is on worship, uh, Brother Cotton, why don't you dismiss us? Yeah. Father, come there, Father. We just thank you so much, Father, for the prayer, Father. Thank you for Brother Jack that he brought the message tonight, Father. And Father, those sick, Lord, we just pray for them. We pray for, we just pray our will, Lord, that there's our duty to get well, Father. But we pray your will, Father. And we just pray you to lead them through the suffering and pray that you'll heal them, Father. And Father, pray so much for Brother Mike for missing her away from the Father. And just give him a safe trip home. If my son and grandson's on the trip, Lord, let's be with them. And all those sick and suffering, Lord, we just pray for them. Amen. Lord, most of all, we thank thee for thee, my son Jesus. Amen. In his name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.